So at the Alzheimer's Association, we know that nutrition plays an important part in just the overall health of a, an individual at any age, but especially as we age. Um, the Alzheimer's Association recommends the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. And both of these diets have a couple of things in common. Those things are lean proteins, uh, legumes, so um, like beans, basically, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, as much as we can get that is fresh, um, as close to farm to table as possible, is wonderful. The other thing that we know is that processed foods aren't great for our brain. So like the more sugars, the more things that we eat that are processed or high in salt, those things are not great for our brain or for our heart. And we know what's great for our heart is great for our brain. So we want to eat things that um, are heart healthy and also uh, just help us to keep our energy up and help us to uh, encourage good blood flow throughout the brain. So again, we want to look at what it is that we're eating, right? What we're putting into our bodies. So we want to eat, um, and this is hard for me because I really like sweets, but we want to eat um, things that are lower in sugar, lower in salt. Um, we want to keep the risk of hypertension down. If we already have hypertension, we want to keep that under control. We also want to look at things like um, diabetes, uh, we know that if we have diabetes in midlife, we are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease in later life. So we want to really keep those types of numbers under control. Other numbers that we want to look at are cholesterol and blood pressure, as well as BMI, which stands for body mass index. Now, with body mass index, there's a lot of different things that come into play, right? Some of us are just what I call bigger bones. So meaning that we just have a bigger stature, not necessarily overweight, we just have a bigger stature. Um, some of us do have a little bit of extra weight that we've carried um, throughout life. And so we also know that midlife obesity can relate to um, Alzheimer's disease in later life. So if we're able to keep those numbers under control, that really helps us to, as much as possible, reduce our risk for Alzheimer's disease in later life. Um, some things that we can do to reduce our risk for having um, significant weight gain is, you know, doing exercises that we enjoy. If we're not enjoying an exercise, we're not going to continue doing it. So, um, for example, I don't particularly enjoy running, right? So I'm not going to sign up for a marathon as part of my exercise routine. That's not going to be helpful for me. If I don't enjoy something, I'm not going to continue doing it. Another thing is to do something with a friend. Um, friends can really help us to continue doing something. So if I was to have an exercise routine on my own that I was just starting out, it would be very easy for me to say, you know, I don't feel like going out today. I don't want to do my walk today. Um, you know, there's a show on TV I would rather watch. I'm feeling like having a bowl of ice cream instead of going on my walk. If I have a friend who's calling me up and saying, hey, Lori, let's let's go for that walk. We said we were going to do this together. It's going to be harder for me to decline hanging out with my friend than it would be for me to just put myself off. Also, I like hanging out with my friends, right? So I'm going to want to go on that walk with my friend as opposed to just hanging out by myself. So we know that what is good for our heart is good for our brain. In 25% of every heartbeat, the oxygen and blood flow from that heartbeat goes to our brain. So every time that we're exercising, we're getting our heart beat up, we're getting our good cardiovascular health, that exercise, 25% of those heartbeats, that oxygen, that blood flow is going to our brain. When we increase the blood flow to our brain, what we are doing is helping our brain, basically it's a like brain food, right? We're getting good um, oxygenated blood cells up to our brain. What happens in our brain with Alzheimer's disease is we have over 100 billion neurons up in our brain. These neurons, basically what they do is they communicate and they tell our body what to do. So the way that they communicate is with these cellular um, signals. 
they're like little chemicals. And so we have pitcher neurons, we have catcher neurons. And what they do is they send these little signals they catch these little signals, right? So with Alzheimer's disease, we have things called plaques and tangles in our brain. And these plaques and tangles are kind of sticky substances and they will kind of surround a neuron um, and suffocate it. Sometimes if a plaque is what we call a tau plaque, it works from the inside of the neuron and it kind of destroys the neuron from the inside. When this happens, the neuron is essentially dead. It has died. It cannot accept these chemicals to tell our body what to do. And they tell our body what to do for everything. It's telling my heart to beat, telling my lungs to breathe, telling me how to talk, how to walk, everything. So when this happens, we, um, the chemicals don't have somewhere to go, right? So when we are exercising, when we're increasing that blood flow and oxygenation to our brain, we are helping to create what we call new neuropathways. Um, this also happens when we learn new things. So if we are learning a new language, if we are learning, um, if, even if we write with our non-dominated hand, or if we drive home a different way than we normally drive home, we are creating new neural pathways. Basically, what these are in the brain are detours. So say this particular neuron um, has Alzheimer's disease, and it, it's suffocated and died from the black and tangles, right? This neuron is trying to send chemicals, and, but this neuron can't catch them. If I created a new neural pathway, well, over here, there is a, a neuron that can catch my chemicals. So I send my chemicals. Oh, this neuron has died, but I've got another little detour, and this neuron can catch them. So my body can still do what I want my body to do because I've created these new neural pathways through oxygenation and blood flow to the brain. So with exercise and Alzheimer's disease, we have what we call kind of like these four different pillars, right? So physical exercise, again, it's good for our heart, good for our brain. So 25% of that heartbeat, 25% of the blood and oxygen from every heartbeat is going to go to our brain. Everything we can do in physical exercise really helps us to increase that blood flow and oxygenation to the brain. Then we have, you know, the good nutrition that we talked about earlier. That helps. We also have um, good sleep, and this is harder for older adults, right? Because we don't sleep as well as we get older. So we're looking at six to eight hours of good sleep. What I tell folks, maybe we don't get that all at once. That's okay. Um, but if we exercise during the day, we're more likely to be tired at night, right? We're more likely to want to sleep at night. Um, maybe we take naps during the day. That's okay too. Um, just as long as within a 24 hour period, we get six to eight hours of sleep. The other thing that we really wanna add into this is social engagement. We want to hang out with our friends. Again, maybe we exercise with our friends. Maybe we go to dinners. Um, when we're with our friends, we have a higher likelihood of making good life choices. Um, I guess that depends on if you have good or bad influence friends. But let's let's go with the assumption that we have good influence friends. Um, so we make better life choices in regards to nutrition, in regards to exercise, in regards to just being together. So if we look at those four different segments, the physical health, the nutrition, getting good sleep, and uh, social engagement. Those four things together can really help us to do as much as possible to keep creating those new neural pathways in our brain and reducing our risk of Alzheimer's and dementia in later life. At the Alzheimer's Association, we have a 24-7 helpline that can be available for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This helpline is available at night, on the weekends, holidays, three in the morning, you can call master's level clinicians that can be available for you. This number is 1-800-272-3900. And again, master's level clinicians answer the phone. Please feel free to call this number at any time. You can ask about local resources in your community. Um, we actually have a partnership with AARP called the Community Resource Finder. Um, and this is where local organizations add their organization to 
the community resource finder and our helpline workers access that so that um, they can help you find something local in your community. You just give them your zip code. They can help you um, say that your person is uh, having a communication issue or a behavioral issue and you're not quite sure how to interact with that, they can help you um, interact with that. Or maybe you're just not sure what those next steps are. You just got a diagnosis or something's different um, and you're just not sure what to do with that. Our master's level clinicians at the helpline can help, um, help guide you through. This is a free service from the Alzheimer's Association, no cost involved. So again, that number 1-800-272-3900.